Hello everybody, this is Life Questions and I'm your host Bill Harris. There are many life-changing events taking place right before our very eyes these days and your viewer questions to us reflect that. We like to feel that Life Questions is one place that you can turn to for some of the biblical insight you need about what's going on now. We have amassed a cadre of local ministers who are armed with the Word of God to address your many questions and concerns, and I'd like to introduce them to you right now. First off, we have Pastor Rick Shear of Living Hope Assembly of God in St. Mary's. Next, Pastor Neil Whitney of the church at Allentown, followed by Pastor Michael Green of Lima Baptist Temple, and rounding off our panel, Pastor Jason Goss of the Wapik Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you with us today. Now, I think that, you know, one of the questions that would really, I think, set the tone for discussions here is one that came in from somebody that's uh, working through an addiction. How many people do we have out there that are addicted to something, you know? And uh, this person asks, I've been, I have an ongoing addiction. I don't really want to say what it is here because I am kind of ashamed. It's not illegal, but I have been really trying to break this addiction. And I'm just not strong enough. I feel like a failure to God. So this is a person that obviously has some remorse yes. about the addiction, says it's not legal, uh, illegal, of course. Uh, Pastor, what, what do you have to say about that? What do you think uh, can be said to help him? Well, if you her? have a habit, usually don't feel guilty about a habit. But if you have an addiction, that brings about guilt because at that point, the addiction is controlling you instead of you controlling the habit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that, that the person feels guilty, and that's a good thing, because if they didn't feel guilty, that would be not as good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, somebody else? I think, I think one of the keys here is that they shared with us that it's not illegal, and I think once you put that into the aspect, I think, I think we all have <laughs> addictions of some sort, yeah. um, you know, and so, what I would want to refer back to, um, and yes, we have failed God. I mean, that's, that's why Jesus died, Amen. because we failed God. However, we need to look back in Scripture. What did Paul write? He, you know, the writer of most of the New Testament says, I do the things that I do not want to do, and yet I don't do the things that I right. want to do. Right. You know, this is, this is I, I don't want to give it a title, and yet it's human nature because we failed. Mm -hmm. And yet... God has given us the ability to come out of these things. I would just encourage this person to continue to seek God and God's wisdom in this uh, uh, fighting of the addiction. I agree with you. Uh, it's a good thing that they're feeling guilty because that's what will lead them to seek God. Amen. And so. I would add that I think they need to um, not be ashamed of it. We all deal with different yeah. things. We all struggle. Yeah. We were not created to do life alone. And mm -hmm. so if you're going to overcome some of that, you need accountability. Mm -hmm. yep. You need somebody in your life who will say, hey, do, how'd you do today? Yep. Hey, are you doing well? Mm -hmm. um, I think they even mentioned, you know, I'm not strong enough. You're right, you're not. You need yeah. God <laughs> and you need somebody else alongside of you who will not condemn you, but who will lift you up and say, hey, mm -hmm. I will fight beside you. I will yep. walk beside you. Yeah. And so don't be afraid to say, hey, I need some help. And no, mm -hmm. condem no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Right. And this gentleman obviously has remorse. He's obviously been seeking God about it and feels like he's a failure to God nonetheless. Uh, but I, think, uh, I think something to remember is that, you know, um, Jesus was human. He was tempted in the same mm -hmm. ways that we were. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that there's a way out of temptation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you're being faced with that addiction, whatever it is, you know, it could be anything. Uh, you know, I have people in my family who have struggled with being addicted to marijuana or being addicted to other substances or being addicted to pornography or, or whatever it is. You know, I think it's, it, it's important to remember that God provides a way out, but also to remember that his mercies are new every day. Mm. Yes. Every day he gives us more mercy, more grace. And I told my brother growing up, you know, he's, he looks to me now as this, you know, spiritual advisor and whatnot, cause he's, you know, not around here, but he, he calls me and he tells me what he's struggling with. And I'm like, brother, remember every day is a new day. Every day, it, it's like we played football together, me and my brother. And I said, every day you get a new opportunity to go out there, play the game, and win. Yeah. And you may have lost yesterday and you may lose today, 
but tomorrow's a new day. And so when you get out of bed and when you put that foot on the floor every morning, man, give that day to the Lord and say, God, thank you for this new day. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. And then walk in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two two words. Two words. Celebrate recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Celebraterecovery.com. Oh, really? A systematic program for addiction that will help anybody, even if they think they don't have an addiction. Yeah. (laughs) When does addiction come from, gentlemen? Where does it come from? I think it depends because addiction can be physical, it can be spiritual, it can be emotional, it can be chemical. I mean, there's so many different, but I I think it comes from our human nature. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately we're trying to fill a void. We're trying to do something that makes us feel good. Yeah. Something that makes us feel like we matter or something that makes us feel good. I was like, that's where it comes from. And, and I mean, let's be honest, addictions are idols they, they, right. because they control us. And it becomes something that we put above our relationship with God. Because if my relationship with God is first, you know, even though I may struggle with something occasionally, I'm not going to be 100% addicted to something. You know, I'm going to be on a pathway to get out of that addiction. So it's just the sheer fall of man in the garden have much to do with this. All these many, many um, years later, is the fall of man still in this equation? Yes, you know, that's what scripture tells us, Mm -hmm. that, you know, the fall of man has created these things. I, I like that you said about it being a void in our life because that's the void in our life is that right relationship with God. Yeah. And ultimately, yeah. that's what we're seeking in any of these addictions, any of these, uh, what do you call it, a habit? Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever we call it. You know, we're, what we're really seeking is that right relationship with God and not understanding that that was paid for. That was paid for 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And that we have it. All we have to do is receive it. And yet you called it, you called it human nature. And I agree with that hundred percent because that's what the fall created was that human nature for us to have sin in our life. Well, we don't always fill that void with, you know, drugs or pornography. Like a lot when you say addiction, that's what people, that's where people's heads go. But what, what about food, exercise, I mean, exercise, there can be a good addiction. I'm addicted, but it's, it's controlling my life versus it could be, I'm a parent of high school students. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm trying to live through them and their sports, yeah. and I'm addicted to their sports. Like I see as a youth pastor, like I see this happening. There are so many parents wow. that they're addicted to being busy. Yeah. They're addicted to having something on their schedule all the time. And because they don't, they don't want to leave any t- extra time just to not be doing something. They're addicted to being busy. Addicted to technology. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many different... I know people that are addicted to Diet Coke from McDonald's because the ice is just the right temperature. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, because, yeah, and so that's why I say addiction can be anything to any of us. Uh, again, it's something that's controlling us, you know, even if we only call it a habit. Right. So you know? we need to exercise some measure of control, don't we? We need to be, to make sure we are the one in the driver's seat mm-hmm. in control so right. that we can direct our relationship to the Lord. I would even go a step further than that because, again, going back to the question, he's not strong enough. He's not strong enough. We have to let God to be the one in the driver's seat of removing that addiction in our life, not us. Because we do that every year. You know, you talked about renewed every day. We do, well, we do that every year with New Year's yeah. Revolution. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And so it just, we can't do it. It's got to be God in the driver's seat. And it's got to be seeking that relationship with him above anything else. Yeah. That's why I love the analogy that Jesus uses when he talks about the yoke, yeah. because you never see a single yoke. A yoke mm-hmm. is where you put two, two. animals together right. going in the same direction. And when we take on the yoke of Christ, when we're seeking him first, he begins to take us in that direction. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it happen in people's lives. Addictions will just fall away. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they, they no long, When they're really pursuing the Lord, they no longer have to fight with these addictions. Mm-hmm. It will just fall away naturally because they're, they're yoked together with mm-hmm. Jesus. And, and if you, uh, I'll take a step further. It's not just yoke with Jesus, but yoke with another believer. Yes. If you go back to that day and time, they would yoke a mature yep. ox with yes. a young ox yes. and the older one would yeah. guide the younger. Yeah. And that we need somebody to hate. Yes. We'll walk with him and say, hey, yep. listen, that's not a good choice. You're making a poor choice. We all need that person in our life to, to give us wisdom. Mm-hmm. 
And yet, uh, going back to the, uh, the ox and the yoke, Jesus doesn't tell us not to be yoked. Yeah. You know, we need to be seeking him. We need to be doing things for the kingdom mm -hmm. because we need to be yoked and yoked together with right. that other person and, and with Christ. Yeah. Seems like we're talking about perhaps mentorship. Discipleship. Yes. Yeah. 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 Discipleship. That's what discipleship is about. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the word calls it mentorship, but you're right. It's, it's discipleship. Okay. Now, here's another question. Uh, we're going to have a break coming up in a second, and, but I, I do want to go ahead and dive into it if we can. Um, and then we'll come back uh, to pick it up. This question, it's two I'm going to put together. Why does God allow suffering? Okay, that's, that's the one line that they had in this letter. But now let's link it with another question from another viewer. Why are children born to parents who don't want them? The children pretty much raise themselves they're slapped around, abused, and worse yet, show no love or affection. Some even uh, become the caretakers of their parents. Why would God want this for a child? How do you answer that? I'm actually the parent of two adopted boys. Is that right? And uh, they're biracial, and we just adopted them last year. And you know, I went through foster care training to be a foster parent, and eventually we adopted them. And there's a purpose in their life. Their mom actually was just um, found in an alley about three weeks ago, gone, um, because of wow. a drug overdose. And... Do the kids know it? They're not old enough really to understand it yet. They're okay. still really young. And, you know, there's a purpose in their life. When, I, when my boys, because they're both boys, when they come to church, they light up everyone's life. <laughs> The struggle that they've been through, the, the, the things that they've been through already at, at three and four years old, you know, it's like there's a purpose in their life. And God isn't, God uses, He's, he's going to use what they've been through already one day to glorify Him, oh, yeah. to point back to Him. Mm -hmm. It's like God doesn't just, He doesn't just allow suffering for no reason, right? If, if they're suffering, you know, there's a reason. There's a purpose. It's 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 putting us on the grinding stone. It's it's chiseling us away. It's 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 shaping us into be the person that he's created to be. And it's like even even if you go overseas and it's someone who is you know being said, hey, deny Christ, or I'm gonna chop off your head. Like that suffering has a purpose. Yeah. There, it's it's not pointless. Like suffering isn't just for no reason. I, I think we. Naturally, so suffering with something bad, which yeah, isn't because yeah. we say, okay, well, there's no God, okay, or God's not all powerful, or God does is not all good, because if God was all good, He would fix the problem. If God was all powerful, He would stop it. And so there's this connotation. That's kind of where we put it. And the 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 understanding is, God is good, all time. and He says that there is no one else that is good. Matter of fact, Jesus says this in Luke. He says, right. Why do you call me good? Yeah. You know, because no one is good. So, uh, and then obviously Romans tells us that no one's innocent. So uh, when we deal with suffering, every one of us makes choices. There are good and bad consequences to those choices. I make a decision, I make a choice, I have to live with those consequences. Mm -hmm. But sometimes my choices affect my brother, affect exactly. my sister. My, and so we naturally think, well, if I'm good, I shouldn't have to abide by any suffering. Well, the problem is, there are people around us that make bad choices. There are governments that make bad choices. There are things that happen, and I'm dealing with the effects of sin. And so, yeah, I'm going to have to go through suffering, but if I trust in God, I know He works all things together for good. Like, you, were, you know, there's a purpose. For our good and um, His glory. Sometimes it's, it's for character building. I, you know, if you are on a football team or if you're, on a, you're an athlete, your coach puts you through situations that caused you to have to kind of fight through, struggle through. Why? Because not because he was a bad coach, because he wanted you to get stronger. Right. He wanted you to build that endurance. Yeah. I remember, you know, in sport, we had to run. I hated running. <laughs> and why did you run? Because in a game, when you're actually in that fight, there comes a point where you get tired. Yeah. And if you didn't build up that endurance, you were no good to the team. And so sometimes that suffering is really helping us build endurance, build character, for the moments for the, that we really need it. And, and if, let's go big term, long term vision. Am I living for this life or, if I, or am I building character for really for the next life? Huh. And that's really what it's understanding is, listen, it's not just about the 70, 80 years I'm on this earth. Yeah. 
It's for the next life. The, that's where I'm building character. My goodness. You know, the, uh, another part of this question, why, why, why would God allow children to come into this world? And, and I was thinking about the fact, you know, I'm a father of five, and I knew, my wife and I both knew, before we had children, that, that when we do have children, that the likelihood of them obeying us and everything <laughs> was quite small, <laughs> but we had him anyway. And so I guess God is that same way with us. The likelihood that we would obey him, he knew some, that would someday be quite small, but he loves us anyway. Now, I'm not saying because he loves us, that doesn't mean we shouldn't correct ourselves and the like, but I'm just talking about the love of God and bringing us into this world. Well, think about that, and we'll come back to it in a minute. I'm being queued up for a break here. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. Thank you for staying with us. We were just talking about you know, the likelihood that, that, that human beings would be obedient was very next to nil, and God brought us into this world anyway. You, you wanted to make a comment about that. Well, the question was, why are children born where they aren't cared about and they're abused? So we know, understand one thing is that there's no excuse for abuse, period. Mm -hmm. There's no excuse for abuse. Those children didn't ask to be born into that situation. That's right. So they're there because of a choice that somebody else made. Yeah. And we have to remember that children are innocent. Children are innocent. Yeah. And like you said, the abuse is a consequence of somebody else right. sitting yeah. against them. So there's three reasons that bad things happen to good children is original sin, our sin, and other people sin. Well, actually, these little children didn't sin. They don't deserve that. Mm -hmm. But they're suffering the consequence of, uh, of adults that I can't say anything good about. <laughs> it's yeah. wrong. Oh. It's abuse. It's wrong. And it's from the original sin. Right. right. You know, it, and, and I would take that. And we need to understand that we need to not be like the religious leaders of the day of Jesus. You think about when he was on the cross and they were telling him, well, if you're God or if God loves you, tell him to bring you off the cross. And we've got to be careful when we ask these kind of questions mm. that we're not accusing God of not being God. Because I think that's what we can fall into thinking that just because he allows this, that he wants it. Or accepts it. Or accepts it. Right. You know, we, uh, our children, I love your analogy about our, our children do things that we do not accept or love or want, and yet we love them, we bless them, we nurture them, we guide them, we teach them, we lead them, just like God the Father does with us. And absolutely, kids are absolutely innocent, and there is no excuse well, for Well, and Jesus abuse. says in Matthew eighteen six that if you cause a child to yeah. go to that sinful life. It's better for you to hang a stone around your neck and, and drown. So there is a, a, listen, there's a warning of caution there. But I think the other issue is God gave us free choice. Mm -hmm. Now, we want free choice, but then we don't like it when free choice causes suffering. We don't like it when free choice causes an innocent to suffer. Mm -hmm. we, that's when we, we are, God, why don't you stop it? Well, God gave free choice. And with free choice comes consequences. And you know, I, I've been to Israel a few times, and um, I went to an area where they had some of these millstones. And boy, if you had one of those things wrapped around you and you were thrown in the sea, you ain't coming back up, buddy. <laughs> you ain't coming back up. Oh my God. Uh, it's just serious, just yeah. serious business there. But um, well, let, let's move on. We, we also have some questions that came in from non Christians. And. Um, there's one here, there are a few things I don't understand at all about the Bible. 
why would humanity be held responsible for two people eating fruit? This is the question from, and this is it's stated here that it's at, being asked by an atheist. Right. Uh, I would say that it's not about the fruit. Mm -hmm. It goes back to what you said. It's about obedience. God is asking, hey, here's the rule. Don't eat of this tree. Don't eat here. But you can have everything else. And so can you obey? And so if you and I could live perfect lives, guess what? We wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a problem. The problem is we sin, we cheat, we lie, we steal, we are lustful. So there is, whether or not you ate that particular fruit, you did not hold up to the standard of God's perfection. Yeah. So therefore, there's a consequence to that. So because you can't obey, because I can't obey, there's a consequence to our obedience. Yeah. And unfortunately, the, 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 the sins of those two, that one couple, just went throughout all of humanity. And so we're all swept into it. Because now. the rule was made for humanity. Yes. Right. Yes, it was Adam yes. and Eve, but the rule was made for humanity. That's what's so silly question. about the argument about who sinned first, Adam or Eve. Yeah. You know, because we, we know that the disobedience was there on both sides. Yeah. Uh, I love the argument of what kind of fruit it was. Uh, it doesn't matter yes. what kind of fruit yes. it was. <laughs> it was the disobedience yes. and choosing to listen to the one that was trying to replace God. And, of course, that's Satan. Yeah. was trying to replace God and they were choosing to listen to him. But the rule was for all humanity, not just for Adam and Eve. Now, another question that we have here too. Why would one person's death alleviate the harm done by someone else? This question as well, asked by an atheist. Why would a person's, one person's death alleviate the harm done by someone else? That's pretty broad. It's very broad. Yeah, it's and we had a great broad. conversation about that before. Uh, before the taping, but go ahead, Jason. Uh, so I'll take the uh, Old Testament model, which was if you uh, kill someone else, you're then punished. Um, and so you have to understand that coming out of Egypt, the Israelites had no system of governing. So God gave them certain laws to govern. Now, if you look at it, there are what we would say is civil laws, laws to govern. There are ritual laws, which are laws the priests had to follow, those kind of things. Those are on the Old Testament. Then you have what is the ethical laws, which then Jesus then establishes again in the New Testament. Okay, so there are laws that we're to follow. There are certain things. One of those was civil laws. Hey, this is how you treat one another. This is how you're supposed to act. This is how you're supposed to live. Because coming out of Egypt, they, they didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And so why, why was one? It didn't, there was no like retribution, reparation that made everything right. But this was the way to establish a system of governance, saying there is a penalty for wrong action. And so that was, in that context, that's how I'd answer that question. But we've already talked about there are multiple ways to answer in context this question. Pastor Whitney, do you want to add to that? Well, it could be taken for the first Adam and the second Adam. Adam being the first Adam and the second Adam being Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. So I always talk about Adam and Eve were connected to God and sin separated them. Yes. And Jesus died on the cross and reconnected humankind to God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it could be taken that way too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. any, other, uh, any other points of view on this? Well, going on with what he was saying is about why would one person's death alleviate the, the harm done by someone else? The, you know, making sure we understand that Jesus was, is, and will always be God. And that is the key there to what you were saying, is that he wasn't just a man. Right. He was man, and he was God. God. And when we focus on that, rather than focusing on his death, or focusing on the alleviating of harm, focusing on Jesus the man, Jesus the God, then we can see that it, it gives us a different view sure. of I, what that I, is. You probably tied into the, the conversation that we just kind of finished was Jesus is the only person who had a perfect life. Exactly. So because he did not sin, he could, there was exactly. the consequence of him not sinning us. He actually set the opportunity for the rest of us to have that reconnection of relationship. That's right. No one else could do that except him. That's right. That's right. He had the money to pay the bill. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> when he died, he said, it is finished. That meant paid in full. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. 
Uh, let's see, I had one here and I just lost it. Uh, oh, here it is. This question, if there is one God, why are there more than 4,000 religions? Because people can't agree. Simply <laughs> <laughs> put, huh? <laughs> I think it stems back um, to our view of God. Um, I got to be careful here because if I don't say this exactly right, it's going to sound like that we shouldn't go to church. And I'm not saying that. We need to be fellowship mm -hmm. in fellowship with one another. So I, but I, so I got to be careful how I say this, but I think this whole idea of the different religions, of course, we can't agree. We don't agree on anything. That's been clear the last two years. Um, <laughs> but that's another show, right? <laughs> but I think when we look at what happened in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. I find that so fascinating because literally man is asking God to teach uh, him, them to pray like another man taught other men to pray. Well, what is prayer? Prayer is talking with God. So they were talking with God about talking to God. <laughs> But I think that's what's created this whole idea of the multiple religions because we, it's, so, it's so human of us right. to want to seek a program rather than the relationship. Hmm. And, and there's nothing wrong with the Lord's Prayer. Please don't hear me that. Don't hear me that. Don't hear that, people. I, or, uh, audience, I, I am not saying that. What I'm saying is that we've got to be careful that we're not focused on the program and that we're focused on the relationship with God. These were men that were literally talking to Jesus, asking him to talk to him. <laughs> well, I think the other thing you've got too is you've got, by human nature, we create rules that God yes. didn't create. And we see that with the Pharisees and Sadducees. There was additional rules that they wanted people to follow. And there's other things that, well, I don't want to follow that rule, so I'm going to push that one aside, and I'm going to stick to the ones I like. So then that creates. And then you get into the, well, is it a theological discussion? Because we have some denominations that are separated by certain theological issues. But then you have some denominations that theologically they mostly agree. It's operational issues. Yes. Hey, we're governed by a body. We're governed by one person. We're sovereign. We're, so that also plays into that. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good comments. Well, thank you very much. Listen, this has been a great discussion. I think we're going to have you back next week, okay? <laughs> we'll be here. <laughs> and that is to say that these gentlemen will be back for our program on next week as we continue our discussions and answering the many questions that you are sending us. And we want to thank you again for all these great questions that you're sending us about life. Well, our time is up for today, and we'll be back again next week. So make sure you take good care of yourself, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>